Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the sixth EU China International Literary Festival. I'm Rianka Mohan, your moderator for this session. This year's theme is Through Women's Eyes, Reading Between the Lines. And in this light, it is a great honor for me to welcome our distinguished speaker from the Netherlands for this event, Mineke Schipper. Mineke is a multi-award winning Dutch author of fiction and nonfiction. As a scholar, she's best known for her work on comparative literature mythologies and intercultural studies. She started her career teaching French and African literature at the Université Libre du Congo between 1964 and 1972. She received her PhD in Amsterdam in 1973, writing the first thesis in the Netherlands on African literature. In 1988, she became the first professor of intercultural literary studies in the Netherlands at the Free University of Amsterdam and since 1993 at Leiden University. Her work, on global oral traditions, proverbs, and creation mythologies has drawn significant attention. In 2008, she was awarded a Dutch knighthood. Her internationally acclaimed book, Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet, Women in Proverbs from Around the World, received the Eureka Award and has been published in a number of languages and editions around the world. She's also published three works of fiction, Conrad's River, The Soul Eaters, and Bird Falls, Bird Flies in 2007, the last which won praise from Nobel Prize winner Jam Kutsi. Her fruitful cooperation with Chinese colleagues is of more recent date. In 1999, she received an honorary doctorate from Chengdu University. Since 2000, she's been regularly invited by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, where she collaborates on projects about epics and creation myths. Today, we will focus on one of her more recent works, Hills of Paradise, A History of Power and Powerlessness, a fascinating and brilliant book which considers the balance of power between women and men across cultures and ages, and how these historical contexts continue to influence current society. From her book, I quote, male fascination with the parts that physically separate women from men has always been great, and there is no lack of male commentary on them. This is a, there is a lot to unpack, and I, for one, am eagerly looking forward to hearing from you. So welcome to the festival and to the stage, Mineka. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you for your kind words. So your book is um, soon going to be published in Chinese by the Guangxi Normal University Press, and it was first published in 2018. And I read it recently, and I think of it almost as critical reading for both women and men. Um, and I've been recommending it, you know, to all my women friends, and it's become something that we discuss around the family dinner table. How did you come to write it, and what has been the general response to it? Well, uh, you see, uh, right from my stay in Africa, in Congo, I have been searching for what do we share as human beings? And, um, well, we... As humans, we seem to insist more on differences than on what we share. And um, so I started working first on differences between uh, cultures and races before I started looking into the, the, the similarities and differences uh, between men and women. So uh, as I did in this book, uh, Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet, uh, which is about proverbs about women from around the world. And there I saw, I saw already these interesting uh, comments of men in proverbs about women. Uh, and the messages are usually uh, a, a woman should be smaller than a man, she should be younger than a man, and she should be less talented than a man in order to be uh, an ideal partner for, uh, for a man. So um, I, I found this and then later I was working uh, with the people in the Chinese Academy, for example, uh, on creation myth and origin myth. Uh, in China. And there um, I found 
that not only in China, but uh, also in, I, as I had discovered before, uh, in uh, creation and origin stories in other parts of the world, to begin with in Africa, but also in, uh, in, in the other continents. And most intriguing is that some very old uh, creation stories uh, are um, representing uh, the the god a goddess the 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 earth is in fact a female body with a lot of birth canals from which all the life is coming up the plants and the animals but also lots of human beings it, right in the beginning and there is no male contribution to the life giving of these very uh, ancient uh, stories of goddesses and um, so in the stories there are the new developments and uh, when the society changes the stories are also changing and this uh, is interesting to see that on this female body the earth as a body uh, there is an old mysterious male person sitting down on this female body and starting taking little bits from her body and making uh, all sorts of things and making animals and giving them life and then making humans and giving them life. So there is something changing, uh, the, the, the spontaneously or uh, self-giving life uh, this human earth body had, this female body. Uh, later it became uh, a cooperation, let's say. And then in the development, you see that finally it is only a male god uh, important enough to uh, to give the life all by himself. He is referred to as a he, like the god uh, in, the, in the monotheism, uh, the, the, the Hebrew, the Jude, in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. Uh, there, so all the goddesses that had been there. Uh, and the same happens also in China in the story of Nuwa, who creates people from clay in the beginning, and later uh, she is she becomes the spouse of Fushi, uh, the the male god. So she cannot do without him anymore. Uh, even though uh, I I read that in China the original concept for god had been the the giving birth. So. That is, that is an ancient word for um, in Chinese. As my colleague uh, Yeshu Shan of uh, Shanghai University told me when we were working on a project on uh, Chinese creation stories. Perhaps I should show this, this book uh, that we did together. It is yeah. also in China. Can you see? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we published this in uh, in the United States and in the Netherlands, but also there is uh, I I I think there is also a Chinese version about these various creation and origin stories from China. So what we see here is that in the religions, the uh, it is the a development from female giving life uh, in the oldest story. And we find it also in the very oldest uh, images that have been digged up uh, in the past. And the, the most ancients are about 40,000 years old or 35,000 years old. And uh, later, they have been found in many parts of the world. Uh, the, the most ancient uh, images are also confirming how important this life-giving process was. So um, if you compare then uh, creation stories from around the world, 
uh, you see that these body parts, the, the, the body parts that women only uh, have only uh, exclusively, uh, you see that in the creation stories, there was apparently a need to change the importance of this life-giving process. And possibly, uh, I thought then, when I was reading many of these stories, that there must have been a sort of uh, head start that women have by giving birth not only to girls, their own kind, but also to boys, whereas the men were not giving birth to their own kind. So it creates uh, an imbalance between the two sexes. And as a result, um, there have been changes in the, in the creation stories, you see. And not only in the stories, but also in the proverbs, huh? trying to, uh, to making the role of women, women less important, uh, uh, insisting on that if she, for example, there is this proverb in Chinese, a woman without talents is already doing very well. Uh, and when I quoted this proverb, when I gave talks about uh, the, the proverbs about women in China, uh, people in all uh, in the public, they say, oh yes, we know this one. It is still around in, in China right now. So we can try to question these stories. Huh? And even interesting in these creator male gods that, that create life on earth, sometimes they, they let the life come from their own bellies uh, by, uh, by, by throwing up life, uh, like Bumba, a creator god in, in Congo, uh, or uh, Prajapati in India, who is uh, saying, uh, who is also giving from his insights birth to the to humans uh, and nursing them, having, having one breast sometime uh, and not one on the other side. So um, all these kinds of of references to the importance of birth giving, but at the same time by belittling women for being able to do this. It's quite spectacular uh, seeing a, a birth giving. Uh, and uh, uh, from the ancient times, uh, well, men uh, contributed, of course, but that was less uh, visible, less you couldn't see this happen. Right. And uh, what is so intriguing is that um, when you look at the, the developments in the scientific research, huh? there was Aristotle, and about a philosopher, a Greek philosopher, an important philosopher who had much influence, mm -hmm. who always said, you know, uh, women have some rough stuff there in their wombs, but the most important uh, the most important contribution and particularly the, the superior part of the human being, being the soul, uh, it comes into the womb uh, with, the, with the man's contribution of the right. sperm. Right. And so in the scientific research, people have accepted this. Well, yes, you know, the women have some food inside, but the most important contribution to the new life comes from the men. Sometimes even they believe that in the sperm there is a complete baby and it has been put inside the womb and that is uh, what it is. And there was an, an important uh, scholar, famous, uh, who invited a micro uh, invented the microscope and he put his own sperm on the microscope and said, oh, yes, I see there is a living human being inside this. So this is how it is. And there was another, perhaps some more uh, uh, carefully looking uh, researcher in the same uh, 17th century in the Netherlands. 
and he studied a, a woman with an ectopic pregnancy. And he said, well, but there is some, some uh, life-giving cells in this part of the woman. So she must contribute also <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the life inside. And uh, then it was agreed by other scholars. And then there was a nervous discussion, but who contributes more? As if that was the most important question. <laughs> you see, so it means there is some, some uh, embarrassment or uneasiness with, uh, with the facts of nature, let's say. Yeah. Like insecurity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and it is confirmed in, in, in the belittling of women, eh? not only in the Proverbs, but also uh, if these gods in the creation stories are creating humans, they are also of little details uh, belittling the woman often, eh? because the, the man is being created first and she comes later or the man is created uh, by the God and the God says, you create your own wife eh, from a piece of wood or something. Or the God created, uh, creates the first man personally. And then he says, well, I'll make now a wife for you from a little part from your body, uh, a, a bit of flesh from the thigh or uh, the, the foreskin or a thumb or a toe and that is in you see it creates hierarchy immediately right. or he create the god creates with his right hand the man and with his left hand the woman and in most cultures the left hand is the inferior hand right. to the right one and if you in the beginning you think perhaps this is just accidentally but when you get 500 or 800 stories, you think, what is going on here? <laughs> and you start uh, looking into it. Huh? And then you find all those other elements, as I have discussed in the book, uh, the, the, the functions of the body parts of the woman, and also the, uh, what has been commented upon these bodies and, and why in the ways it has been done. Huh? The, the, the violence, for example, that this problem in so many uh, marriages and so many um, societies. And um, well, if you look into uh, the various chapters of the book, you will come across all these uh, rules and confirming hierarchies between men and women and also the insecurity uh, and the, the feelings of inferiority very often in women. Yes. Don't yeah. you think so? I think so. Like I wanted to talk about that because you know you talk about the idea of male fear, right? And 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 how um this kind of made them want to control the narrative yeah, around yeah. women. Like, for example, the story of Adam and Eve. I mean, I, I, as a Christian, I was thinking, yeah, I took it for granted that God created. And even as a mother, I didn't think about how illogical it is that that a woman is not involved at all and God created. And not only that, Eve comes from the rib and she carries this sin. Yeah. You know, she's the one yeah. who is at fault. But yeah. the, so, so it, it is also contributed to cultivating female shame, right? In our own body parts. I mean, yeah. like we don't discuss the vulva, we don't, the process of menstruation is often like this shrouded silent thing that you're embarrassed about. Um, yeah. You know, in parts of Nepal and India where I'm from, you know, you, you sort of, um, you're forbidden from entering temples during your men when you're menstruating because you're considered impure. And in some extreme yeah. cases you're supposed yeah. to live in a hut um, yeah. away from 
from everything everybody else mm -hmm. so um I, I i wanted to also talk about you know because i thought that part was very powerful when you talk about the ancient meanings that were associated with the vulva and and you have a chapter about you know powerful blood can you mm -hmm. talk about that and kind of how what it was before and how much meaning was attached and associated with it um yeah well it is um the first element that is, seems to have been creating fear in men is sometimes the defloration of women. And so men who, who are worried have before the, the marriage night, the first night uh, after the, the, the marriage ceremony, and that in uh, as Her Herodotus, the, 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 who is a historian from the Greeks who has written about it, how in some societies, this was something so frightening that some husbands, the, 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 the young married, uh, the, the groom, uh, he, he let, he, he let's the defloration uh, do by someone else right, because right. he was too uh, frightened by the idea that if the, some blood comes with uh, yeah. with the in the first night the uh, the virgin uh, is deflor deflorated or how you call that um, yeah yes so he um this blood seems to be so powerful that uh, something can go wrong with you and uh, it can destroy you or it can make you uh, uh, important for the rest of your life. So all these anx anxious feelings, uh, I think uh, it is good that we no longer have to have these feelings because it would make things quite difficult uh, in a relationship. Uh, and uh, so it, that is one of the things. And then the, the idea of, of menstruation, there are some stories about menstruation. And also sometimes there are even myths about it. For example, there is a, an Islamic story about Adam uh, and Eve, and uh, Eve is eating from the fruit in the, in paradise, the forbidden fruit, and she swallows it completely. And Adam tastes it. He has he swallows only a little bit, but it sticks into his throat, right. and his Adam's apple comes from there. So it's a physical proof that he was not swallowing the whole fruit. Uh, but Eve did, and as a result, she had her first menstrual bleeding because of swallowing this forbidden fruit. You see, as it is, as if it is something negative, right. but it's like not always uh, uh, seen or told as something negative. As in uh, in India, uh, there are some stories that. In the beginning, women had no menstruation, and so the the children they gave birth to were not complete. Huh? They they died, or they had they lacked some limbs, or they had no real good blood blood because <laughs> there was no menstruation left. And then God decided to give menstruation to women, <laughs> and from then on, had they had good. Uh, good children, healthy babies, <laughs> and so and so forth, which is also very positive uh, about menstruation. So it's not always negative, but in some uh, cultures, uh, it is silenced. Uh, you cannot talk about it, uh, although it is something natural. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mystery for people was that as soon as the menstruation stopped for younger woman, women, then she was pregnant. So people explained, you see this, this blood all goes to the baby now. 
And that's why the baby can grow and be healthy. So you, you see everywhere we make stories as humans. A human being is a storyteller. Right. So we invent stories all the time and we adapt the stories to what seems logical or what uh, seems protecting us uh, in, in the lives that we are living together. Yeah. Yeah, so in this context, like it was remarkable to read about the change in how the Madonna, the Virgin Mary is depicted, right? That yeah. in, in yeah. Christianity, in religion, she went from this image of having a bare breast and a baby on uh, the baby Jesus on her breast to suddenly being, yeah. oh no, that's that's not a symbol of nourishment, but an erotic yeah. image. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I think the more perfect the breast was painted by the, by the artists, uh, the, the, the celibate uh, priests uh, felt this became too erotic. And, mm -hmm. and so the, the message, the original uh, message of pious uh, reverence uh, or the adoration of the Virgin but that was no longer uh, the effect of these beautiful Madonnas. And uh, so they decided that the breast had to be covered and, uh, and nursing for, for mothers in public in, in many places is no longer something natural. Uh, no. The breasts have been so much eroticized that the, the original function of breasts, nursing babies, uh, yeah. seems to become a problem. I even read about Weibo, the, the media in, uh, in China, that a woman who was breastfeeding her baby in the, in the underground, uh, the, the, there were photos made of her and, and, and uh, circulating you think you are in a village here, but you are in Beijing. Wow. <laughs> so uh, breastfeeding, you can't do this. And then there was a, a, a medical doctor who was also a mother who, who reacted to this and said, look, this is something natural. And uh, why, huh, if the baby needs to be, to be fed in the, in the underground, uh, she can cover it with a, with a blanket, but yeah, these are natural things. But for most people, it, it has become something that's no longer natural. <laughs> you, you have yeah. to do it hiding yourself. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, which no, is something... I yeah, sorry. I, I felt it in New, sorry, I felt it in New York as well, you know, when I first had my children and we would be out in public, um, yeah. I remember having in certain places having to go to the restroom to sit yeah. in a in, in yeah. a in to feed because it was frowned upon um, yeah. to, to feed yeah. your child and, and, and there's been yeah. outrage about it over time you know, with yeah, women saying yeah. that this is yeah. unfair, you, you ask yeah. us to go feed our children yeah. in places that are unhygienic. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. so in that context, like, it's interesting you bring up this idea that universities call themselves alma mater, which is mm -hmm. nourishing mother, right? Yeah. Graduates are alumni or suckling. So yeah. how did we go from this image of the multi-breasted Artemis in Greek mythology to now, to, to this idea of Womenhood and wisdom being associated to today, where none of those, none of those meanings still hold. Yeah, well, I think it is good to know. You, you see how these ideas came and developed. It is quite ironic that alma mater, the 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 nourishing mother, in fact. But all the circlings, <laughs> all the all the her children were all male over the <laughs> centuries. Uh, yeah. Even that there was a, a Dutch professor uh, in the 19th century who said, "Well, uh, the the womb will shrink when the woman goes to the university, and wow. she will not be able to to give birth anymore if she is 
studying too much. Uh, and, and, and the parallel is that in, in Saudi Arabia, they have tried to um, prevent women from, from driving cars because that will give problems uh, to their uh, tombs. How, how do you call it? The two, the, where the eyes, the little eggs are. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. To the womb? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh. So <laughs> that, that would shrink. So if she was going to drive cars, I think now they can in, in Saudi Arabia. But, but it's uh, you see, yeah, it's, there have, all sorts of arguments have been invented to prevent women from doing other things uh, that uh, should be allowed only to men in the in the, in the in the tradition, according to the tradition. So, well, we have to talk then about traditions in our different societies. Where do traditions come from? Uh, and how relevant are they still today? So that's why we have to talk about these kinds of things. And the body is an important issue uh, in referring to these different paths for men and women in the past, uh, uh, where some of the, of the things women were not allowed to do had nothing to do with the shape of the body. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just the, the rules or the prescriptions or the laws or whatever. And what is, for example, interesting that the origin of uh, agriculture, uh, it is sometimes uh, some, more than more and more people agree that the, the original invention of agriculture was done by women. They, they uh, were the, the collectors of food and the men were the hunters. Mm -hmm. And so around the houses, they saw that seeds you had dropped that they came up again and that you could make a little garden. And sometimes when the men came home without any game, they had no, no, they didn't bring food. Then the women sometimes said, well, you see, we still have some food for everybody. And that created a sort of uneasiness because, you know, uh, we were the, the bringers of food and what is happening here. Uh, but then the men invented the plow and then you could make uh, well, make more cultivate more food than ever before and then there was more sort of a, of a balance huh? I don't know how it's in China or in other parts of the world but here sometimes there is still a discussion about in a couple who is earning more money than the other one now and if it is the woman uh, then sometimes it still creates uneasiness like with the old hunters who came home without game and then the women could uh, provide some food so all these things uh, they have been uh, become a sort of self-evident logic Mm -hmm. And and if we know where it comes from, I think we uh, we can better handle the changes. That, that's and what that, I thought was amazing yeah. about the book, because, you know, I think of myself as an educated woman, and it was such a thought-provoking book, because these are ancient stories, but the idea that the vulva was a symbol of strength, that it, it hung... Um, you know, a symbol of it, the triangle hung above a chieftain's hut. Yeah. It's a very yeah. powerful thing as a woman to consider, right? Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it shifts how we think of ourselves, I think, that these old yeah. stories. And, and, and so, I, you know, you, you brought up very good examples of where we lost out. So um, there's parts of it when I'm reading your book, I feel grateful. Oh, thank God we don't have, we're not governed by these stories, right? But I think in some cases we still are by yes. the perceptions they leave in us. And so what do you think we have lost in seeing the world this way from this male centric lens? Yeah, well, I think you see, we cannot change the past, you see. But what we can change is our own perspective on the path. 
on the, on the past. So that's what I think is, is, is crucial. And perhaps more important is uh, the conversations we have huh, among men, among women. And, uh, you know, I am not an, an, an extreme uh, feminist. Uh, I always say I, I'm more an equalist than a, than a, a, a feminist. I grew up with five brothers, and uh, so I have seen that we all have our insecurities. We all have, you see, our the messages from the past. Mm -hmm. And if you feel uh, being asked to always be strong and courageous and without insecurities, that is the message to men. And uh, women, having been belittled, and, uh, and for a while they are very beautiful, and then uh, they grow older and uh, they feel very insecure about that. So we have to, to leave all those things behind, because even when you are in your old age, uh, life can be very beautiful and uh, you can do a lot of things and are can be... Uh, quite secure of yourself without having to, to, to spend so much time and so much money on your exterior, on your beauty, on your, uh, your presence and um, your appearance. I think, you see, on the one hand, what happens to women today is uh, to stay an object of beauty, a sort of an object. Huh? And looking at yourself, then you do this uh, not from uh, yourself as if how you feel, but how others look at you. And you have to obey to that. So that is one side. And on the other hand, there are those women who have to hide themselves all the time. Huh? They are locked up in their house by husbands, or they are, uh, they are to hide their face because of uh, some religious, uh, supposed to be a religious rule, which is not really, uh, for example, in the Quran that women have to hide their face. But that's something, uh, a separate topic. But um, so I think uh, women should uh, be less aware of their uh, their appearance, but more aware of the, the wonderful talents they have. Uh, so it is, uh, if you look at the past, uh, the women have been so much belittled that it has become difficult for them to, to survive <laughs> as a human being. Uh, after you have lost your sex appeal, uh, that you should have according to the, the, the publicity and the, the adverts that you are surrounded with all the time. We can also say, look, this is not the only thing. This is not the most important thing, uh, but let's just share our talents uh, as men and as women and do uh, work together and, and the good thing about human beings is that they can also change their views. They can reflect on their views. And so that makes uh, that I am hopeful about the future. You know, uh, the, there are so many echoes around with messages from the past. Uh, and as long as we swallow these, then nothing will change. But if we think, wait a moment, uh, let's have a look again at where we come from. Because um, if we don't know where we come from, uh, we don't know what direction we are going to go. That's fantastic. I mean, I think, I think you raise a very good point. And actually, you have this um, powerful notion in your book that you talk about where you say male fear and awe still exist everywhere and women are too little aware of their power. Yes, uh, yes. 
And what did you mean by that? And can you elaborate on that fantastic point you raised with this observation on power, about yeah. female power? Yeah, well, you see, if there was no so many signs around of male uh, fear, uh, then uh, women, if women are aware of that fear, then they uh, they could help uh, diminishing this fear by talking with men about this fear or uh, referring to it or uh, and if you your you have both your fears and insecurities and the women a lot about this appearance uh, problem but if you can put your fears on the table yeah, you, and you are sitting around and you talk about it i think this will be a relief for all of us mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. that's what i think yeah absolutely i mean and 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 women have also been raised like you brought up right because of advertising because of societal expectations yeah. to be to be constantly insecure and to be constantly fixated on appearance yeah and yeah. and while you know you, you bring up in the book that that men have have shifted away from just looking solely at appearance but also what value they bring um yeah. as beings right to, to society and what contributions they make um yeah so in in this context do you think women are our own worst enemies sometimes that because we are so conditioned um our mothers our fearful mothers kind of who are our first role models or, or you know um or should be yes. our first role models how can we shift our own thinking on this uh, you see, many mothers did not have the same opportunities as, as we have. Uh, if you are aware of that, uh, uh, you can be very grateful that you have more opportunities. Mm -hmm. And uh, But stay conscious of the fact that so many other women uh, do not have yet these opportunities uh, there is an enormous gap between the rich and the poor in the world mm -hmm. and um, I, I once gave a talk to um, to uh, in a mosque in Nairobi and um, there were only a few men but many women it was about proverbs and uh, after the talk, uh, the, the women stayed for a long time. And uh, so they said, you know, uh, we have uh, our men, our men can ma take another wife. And uh, if I don't accept, then they will send me away. And he keeps the children. And where should I go? What, what can I do for my own daughters? And I said, well, the most important thing is that they go to school, mm -hmm. that they that they have a good education. That is the, the, the most important step uh, because uh, the brains have not been divided between the sexes. <laughs> we all have them have have our own talents and our, our own gifts in life uh, to share with others, but we need education. And we need to, to see more than the adverts that push us <laughs> to, to take into account the, the less relevant kinds of life. But I think to be human means also to take care of others and to uh, try and make the world a little better than we found it when we started growing up. That's fantastic. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you know, um, you collected all these proverbs in your other book, right? Um, Don't never marry a woman with big feet. What is one that has stayed with you over time? Yeah, well, that is a, that is a wonderful um, uh, proverb. Uh, I liked in, in, in China was 
uh, a teapot can serve five teacups. But who has ever seen a teacup serving five teapots? It is about, it is a fact also about sex, but it's also about, uh, about power. Nice. And, uh, but then the idea is that the women are always associated with the cups and the men with the teapots. But uh, I think this is an interesting uh, way of introducing a debate, for example. Right. Saying we, can, we can look at where do the metaphors come from? Huh? Uh, in Proverbs, it's very often the man who is the eater yeah. and the women are uh, the metaphor for the women is all kinds of, of food, uh, fruits or cakes or soups or whatever. And the, so the one is the eater and the other is the food. Or had, the one is the teapot, or the other is the cup. Yeah. So we have to look into our metaphors too, and how we accepted these metaphors in the past, yes. and, and thought, well, this is how it is. So maybe we can we can break both that teapot and the teacup and come up with something. <laughs> yeah, well, we can invent other or new uh, <laughs> proverbs. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm right now I'm uh, working on a new book. It is about widows. Uh -huh. And widows is a, a very special category uh, in uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And well, it opens up for new for me a new perspective on on the way women have been considered as yeah. a woman without a man is, is she is not really any interesting anymore, <laughs> for example. But um, I've, uh, going back to the proverbs, uh, there, is a, there was a, a, a woman's movement here who invented a proverb a woman without a man is a fish without a bicycle. <laughs> so you see. So uh, you. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can also change the metaphors and you can joke about metaphors mm -hmm. and you could, yeah, we can go new ways and find new ways without competition, without. A uh, rivalry about what, what kind of bodies we have or, or we don't have. I think you see it is up to ourselves how the future will look like. Yeah, yeah, very well said. <laughs> um, you know, you, you also brought up this other point in your book. You talk about the chaos of life involves ambivalent us them relationships in which differences are more more often emphasized than similarities. The line you have it, that you wrote, um, the chaos of life involves ambivalent us-them relationships in which differences are more emphasized, more often emphasized than similarities. Yes. Um, yes. And why do you think this is? And how can we move away from doing this? Not just in yeah. gender yeah. Um, equations, I, but yeah. other. Mm -hmm. I think it's very human to, um, to create hierarchies. You see, when you compare, you start making this is better than that, or this is higher than, than and, and that is lower. Mm -hmm. But the, the question is then how we can, um, how we can ch change, or at least how can we be aware of that? Huh? And, um, you see, the similarities that we share uh, um, they are there all the time. Uh, the, the, the similarities between human beings in different cultures and in different uh, parts of the world, but also um, we can, we then must be aware that is a beautiful proverb that I think of. Uh, it comes from West Africa. Uh, about the foreigners and us. 
a dish uh, going like this. No matter how long the tree trunk lies in the water, uh, it will never become a crocodile. It, this is from the perspective of the villagers, you see. He can stay with us, this other one, but he will never be one of us. Mm -hmm. I think the art of living in a peaceful world is probably uh, to not only to look at the differences between this foreigner and us, but more in the sense of uh, what is there that we share? We share a lot as humans. Uh, we have the same bodies, except for these few body parts that distinguish men and, and women. But that is, uh, we have the same bodily functions. We have the same needs and the same emotions like love and fear and uh, jealousy or whatever. But you see, this, this, the similarities should be a, an important part. Uh, in the West, there is a, an enormous discussion about identity, and everybody is insisting so much on cultural or racial ident identity. Uh, whereas, uh, I think when you only see that difference, then how can you live in, in, in the same world uh, without being suspicious vis-a-vis -vis one, uh, one another? So um, I think it's quite important in our world to think we share so much. We have to, to work together on a world uh, with in, in enormous problem as climate change. You see, we have to work together in spite of our differences. Uh, if, if the similarities of our, not only of our bodies, but of our fate as human beings living on this vulnerable planet, uh, we, we do have to, uh, to work together and to forget about the, all the, the, the oppositions and the, the contrasts and the differences because it is a matter of survival uh, right now. Very wonderfully and wisely put. So <laughs> I, I uh, want to check with you if there's anything else you would like to add for our, for our audience here in, in China or in, the, in Europe, the um, festival. And a book I did with a Japanese woman. It is about humanities and as a new beginning. This is about uh, world disasters in myth. And uh, this is about old myth about the end of humanity. And what is interesting in, uh, as for this book, but also for, um, uh, for the old stories uh, in China, but everywhere in the world, we have stories about how humanity almost ended mm -hmm. uh, and then but then the hopeful thing is that in these stories about the flood uh, or about world fires about or about the the heaven is crushing down on the earth because the the humans have not been careful taking care of the earth and so these old fears uh, have become reality in, in the world of today. So I think on the one hand, uh, we fear our, for our own survival, but in, in the meantime, uh, we can do something about it. We have all those warnings now and and that's why it is so important to work together as men and women, but also as humans in different continents, in different cultures, in different nations. And uh, so it is quite interesting to see that old stories uh, have a meaning, have a new meaning for today. And 
as it was with the, the, the creation stories about men and women, uh, we have to look at them again in our new context. And the same hold, holds for the myth about the end of humanity and how the gods allow some of us to survive, to start anew and to do it better uh, because uh, humans can learn something, fortunately, from the past. And in that sense, I think the lessons of old myth uh, and the development of old myth can teach us uh, wisdom for today. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I look forward to seeing your, your book, um, Hills of Paradise in Chinese in the Beijing bookstores. I'm sure it will do very, very well. Thank you so much for this, for this discussion today. And, um, um, and, and, and hopefully we will, we will see you in person in China once the, uh, once the yes. crisis is over. Yeah. I was already invited to Shenzhen to the University of Shenzhen, where I have given talks uh, a number of times already. But while well, we have to wait a bit for the end of the COVID crisis and yes. uh, hope to see you there then. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mineka.